celebrating our International Leadership Summit where people are gathering from all around the world to experience ILS. If you have not registered, you're welcome to do so. There's still some few seats available. If you want to att and, uh, attend and learn and grow as a leader, you don't know where God's going to take you. I'm going to say it again. You don't know where God's going to take you. And then some of you do know. It does not yet appear yet. But you already know in your spirit that it's down inside of you to lead. You're in the background right now, but God's going to put you in the forefront. And he's getting you ready, hallelujah, and establishing you and teaching you. And you listen differently from people with, who don't really recognize their destiny. When you know you have a destiny, you listen with a different ear so that you can hear and prepare yourself. Because when you walk into it, you're not going to have time to get ready. You're going to have to be ready. I'm going to try that again. When you walk into it, you're not going to have a chance to be ready, to get ready. You're going to have to be ready when you walk on the door day one, ready to execute and do what the Lord has called you to do. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God is so good. I'm particularly excited. Uh, a, a very, very significant person to American history who has been on the forefront and the front lines and still going on. I think he's almost 90 years old or so, and mine is sharp as a tack. Ambassador Andrew Young will be, hallelujah, will be our guest, and I'll have the privilege of sitting with him. Uh, he was there uh, at, on a Lorraine Motel in Memphis when Dr. King was shot. But not only that, he was in the background uh, before he was in the forefront, he went on to be the mayor of the city of Atlanta and now serving as ambassador, continuing to impact lives. He's seen leadership on every level, been chased, water hose, dogs, everything else in the back room, in the meetings, in the boardroom. He's got so much to say that you haven't read in a book, that you haven't seen in a textbook, that you may not ever get a chance to enjoy again. So make it your business to be there for the opening session as we open up with Ambassador Andrew Young. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I have known him for a number of years, and every time I sit down and talk to him, it's like opening up an encyclopedia. The, his ability, his command of foreign affairs and national issues and leadership on all levels, his, his ability to construct and organize deals that built the airport in Atlanta didn't even exist before Andy Young and so many other amazing things that he has done. He has so much information and I'm looking forward to sitting with him and sharing with him and having a master class for you as you face new challenges that we have never seen before. At the bottom of it all, you gotta have courage. I said you gotta have courage. You can't be a wimp and lead. You gotta be strong in your gut, in your belly. I didn't say mean now. Some people mistake courage for mean. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be nasty. You gotta have some backbone and some spine and some get back up again and some fight back and some staying power and some consistency. Hallelujah. And by the way, you're gonna need some anointing to destroy the yokes of the enemy. Glory to God. Sometimes you're in a situation where you can't say it out loud, but you got to be able to plead the blood in your head until demons tremble and hell gets nervous and yokes are broken and say, yes, good evening. How are you today? And still in the back of your mind, you say, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The blood of Jesus is again. Anybody in here know how to be a secret agent? You got to be a secret agent for the Lord. The dates, by the way, are March 21st through the 23rd. Mark it off on your calendar. Get here any way you can. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 12, verse 1 through 8. There you will find the discussion of God with Abram, the discussion of God with me, 
the discussion of God with you, the discussion of God with us for this morning. Genesis 12, verse number 1 through 8, when you have it, say amen. amen. Now listen closely at this powerful conversation that God has with Abram, not Abraham, with Abram from Mesopotamia, from the Chaldeans, from an idolatrous background. God snatches him out and says, come here, boy, I want to talk to you. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of that country and from your kinfolks. Uh. And from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you where you're leaving is definite where you're going is opaque I'll show you when you get there and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shall be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Come on. <clears throat> so Abram didn't obey, didn't disobey. He departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old. And he was just getting started. I'm going to say that again. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he started, when he departed out of Haran. Stop letting these demons tell you you're finished. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. Pay attention to that. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanites was in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram second time and said, unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord. Aren't you glad you built an altar and gave an offering this morning? And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Good God Almighty, I will bless thee I will make you a blessing. I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. 
and through what's about to come out of you, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. This morning, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk to you from the subject, blessed by the best. We're going to try this on. Just look at somebody and say, I've been blessed by the best. Oh, you didn't sound like you really mean it. Look at them and say, I've been blessed by the best. You may be seated. My God, my God, my God. I've been blessed. <laughs> I've been blessed by the best. Hallelujah. Yeah, and I'm glad about it. <laughs> Allow me, if you will, indulge me for a few moments to set the text up in a preamble that seems totally irrelevant to the text, but hopefully will stitch into the text with a principle and a metaphor that is relevant to your life. How many of you have gone into a theater to see a movie in the summertime and get inside the theater and find it so cold you wish you had a sweater. <laughs> you running around in shorts and a wife beater and walk in the theater and and the conditions on the inside are different from the conditions on the outside. And you, how many of you gotten on a plane and almost froze to death? And even in the summertime, it was hot outside, but it, the plane was so cold that you had to reach up there and get that little blanket and wrap yourself up in it. Come on, guys, some of us too, with our macho self. <laughs> had to cover up because we were going. How many of you have been in church? <laughs> and felt cold <laughs> even in the summertime. There, there are moments in your life, I learned something from my wife. My wife has a saying that she says, I dress for the conditions on the inside and not for the conditions on the outside. And sometimes in so doing, you have to be willing to look foolish for a moment to be comfortable long term. When I came to Texas, I came from West Virginia, and, and I, the first year I was here, I loved the city, but the, it was so hot. I thought that God had sent me to Hades. <laughs> it was real hot. And we had just bought this, this old building that at the time was called Eagle's Nest when we bought it. Some of y'all remember it? <laughs> and Eagle's Nest was about 86,000 square feet, which is no small place. But we had, yeah, we had so many, y'all, yeah. We had so many people in that 86,000 square feet jumping and shouting and praying and being slain in the spirit and filled with the Holy Ghost and delivered and set free that, that we would, you would have to shout and fan. <laughs> so when we got ready to build this new sanctuary, the sanctuary we're standing in right now, we built from the ground up. This was just, this was just flat land. I spoke to the wall on the right side of the old church and said, get out of my way. Y'all remember that? And we started building what would become a 282,000 square foot sanctuary. Now we went from 86,000 to 282,000 square feet 
in this building alone, that's a big difference. So when I met with the architects, there's, there's nothing, there's not, no catwalk I haven't walked through. The, I've been on the roof. I remember when they poured the concrete for the stage. I don't have to ask any questions about this building. I was physically involved and connected with the building of this church. I remember when there was no carpet on the floor and we all came over and wrote scriptures all over the floor so that everywhere you would sit or stand, you would be standing on the Word of God. Y'all remember that? Thank you, Jesus. We, we, we multiplied, and I told the architect, I said, listen, I don't want to be hot. I don't care if the place is packed and everybody is jumping. See, this church was built for worshipers, not spectators. <laughs> So if you come in here and you're just a spectator, I'm, I apologize, I didn't really have you in mind because over in the old church, we was jumping. I was 38, we was jumping, <laughs> yeah. Not they was jumping, we was jumping. And I built it for active movement. And you know when we all get together and we all get to jumping, we produce certain amount of BTUs, just us as and we as and you and And I said, I wanna be sure that I have the capacity to keep the building cold, whether we're having conferences or conventions or what have you. Now, I admit, you know, we kind of overdid it. <laughs> we, we later built the new building, the place, and added an additional 155,000 square feet. The combined square feet of both places, all the floors, all the elevations, all the counseling rooms, all the classrooms, all the work rooms, all of it combined together comes to 437,000 square feet. Now somebody say, I'm blessed. So instead, we have no air conditioning. <laughs> we have no air conditioning. Most in generally in a building, you have air conditioners on the roof or on the side. We have no air conditioning. We have a chiller. Inside the chiller plant in this building, there are four chiller units. I'm going somewhere with this. There are four chiller units. The chiller has so much power that when we built the addition onto the building, we didn't have to add anything to the chiller. One chiller is strong enough to keep both buildings cold without adding anything else to it. We have three additional chillers, but one chiller alone will cool the entire complex. So we rotate from chiller to chiller to chiller to chiller so they have never gotten old because the supply is greater than the demand. Come on with me. This leaves us with 450 ton units and one 250 ton unit for expansion should you ever decide to add anything else. Literally, we could support a small city with our chiller system. That's the capacity. That's how strong it is. So when we get ready to move from one unit to the next, we do it so that it will not get uh, old. So the same units we originally had are still functioning without interruption by rotation because the supply is so extensive. All we had to do was run duct work to the next building. 
because the chiller was strong enough to support any space we built. We just needed ductwork. Now you have to understand that for the purpose of this illustration, the chiller represents the grace of God. He has more grace than we have space. <laughs> he has more blessing than we have burdens. <laughs> he has more power than we have problems. He doesn't have to strain or stretch himself or recreate himself. When he said it is finished, it was over. Not just that which is, but that which was and that which shall be. He'll never have to get up and do anything else because he's got enough power to accommodate exceedingly abundantly above all that ye may ask or think. So whatever you're dreaming about, all you need is duck work to reach it. Because the chiller is strong enough to accommodate all that you can imagine. That's why he sat down and said, I'm through with it. I'm completely done. Whatever you want to build from here on out, I won't have to add to my ability in order for you to build your vision. You're set. All you need is duck work. You don't need more grace. You don't need more blessing. You just need duck work. Now, the duck work is where faith comes in. <laughs> For we are saved by grace through. Come on, talk back to me. Wake up. Talk back to me. We are saved by grace through faith. So when you read in Hebrews 11, by faith, Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch walked with God and was not. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not yet seen, built an ark to the saving of his house. How did they do it? So faith is a conduit that takes the blessing and allows it to travel to the next thing you're about to do. All you got to do is have enough faith to be able to bridge the gap between where you are and where you're going because the grace is the chiller unit that is so strong it can accommodate exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you may ask or think. God will never have to add on to it. It is enough. In fact, El Shaddai, it is more than enough. Whatever you're dreaming about for 2024, it is more than enough. In 2025 and 2030, whatever you got on your mind, whatever expansion, whatever building, whatever growth, whatever increase, whatever you're going after, whether you're going back to school or opening up a home for unwed mothers, whatever your vision is, God has already accommodated you with enough blessing to enable you to disconnect from your family and your kindred and where you came from and never run out of power because God has already powered your vision. Stop asking God to fund your vision. The fund is already there. The question is, do you have the duck work? Because if you have the duck work, it will allow the blessing to reach according to the capacity that you have. The Bible said that the prophet spoke to the woman and said, get a, a, a pot, your pot of oil, just one pot of oil, and borrow from all your neighbors. And she began to pour out of that one pot of oil. And as long as there was capacity, 
there was flow. The flow did not stop until they ran out of vessels. It said, borrow the vessels and borrow not a few, because I'm not a God of little bitty thinking. He said, give me something big to work with. Give me something great to work with. Give me something that it doesn't look like you've got the capacity to fulfill, but in the flow, I'm going to flow and you're never going to run out. I don't know who I'm talking to. But that flow, that capacity is endless. The book of Ephesians says that God who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and things that pertain unto life and godliness, God, blessed be God, excuse me, blessed be God who hath blessed us. Blessed be God is the chiller who hath blessed us. That's the faith that reaches us with what he has already prepared. Let me go back further. Your eyes have not seen, your ears have not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man with what I have the capacity to give you. Let me go back further then. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth looking for someone he can show himself strong to. He said, if you give me something, I'll fill it. If you build it, I'll fill it fill it. If you can think of it, I can make it happen. If you walk in the door, I'll walk in there with you. I'm that kind of God. I have blessed you. I am blessed you. Somebody holler, I'm blessed. You need to hear that because for so long the enemy has told you that you're inadequate, that you're not enough that you're cursed, that you're foolish, that you're not young enough or strong enough or old enough or pretty enough or bright enough, but you are blessed. You're blessed. You cannot dress for the conditions around you. You've got to dress for the place he has prepared for you because you're gonna walk right out of the conditions around you. And you're gonna sit in the place that God has prepared for you. So you gotta change your thinking from dressing for the temporary and start preparing for that that is established that's yours. Somebody holler at me, I'm blessed. Good God of mercy. Demons tremble when you say that. They wouldn't mind if you said, I'm going to be blessed. I hope to be blessed. I will be blessed. But when you take blessed and put ED on it and past tense like it's already there, if I needed to make it cold enough in here to hang meat, all I'd have to do is turn on all the units. God has an endless supply. Do you have a vision a capacity, even if you have to borrow vessels. If you got the faith to borrow, I got the faith to flow. Setting this illustration up as a preamble to the text is important to me because it gives you a visual illustration much like Jesus used parables to teach. He used things you can relate to to teach things you could not relate to. The kingdom of heaven is lacking unto. The kingdom of heaven is lacking unto. The kingdom of heaven is lacking. He, he uses metaphorical illustrations to teach the profundity of divine truth because what God has for you is so amazing. He has to use oxymorons to describe himself. He, he, he has to use, he has to use uh, theophonic ideas that make you realize the magnitude of who God is. I'm looking for words not coming to my mind right now, but, but he, he, uses, he uses these illustrations to the intent, like he covereth me with his feathers does not mean that God is a bird. Or the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth doesn't mean that God has seven eyes but he's just trying to reduce to his lowest common denominator what it means to be omniscient, that he is all-knowing, 
that he is all seeing, that he is in all places at all times, that he can do all things. And you sitting up there worrying about that little need like he can't chill it. I was in Nigeria recently, and they have an expression in, in Nigeria that they taught me. They call it chill accent. Yeah, they say this chill accent, Bishop. You mean it's to chillax. And what I'm trying to tell you is to chillax. Whatever you're stressed about, whatever you're worried about, whatever the enemy's threatening you with, whatever he's trying to do with you, chillax. God has already built to accommodate. <laughs> Who am I preaching to? Somebody online needs this word. Can I go deeper? Now let me begin to play just a little bit with the outer parameters of this text. Abram is not the Abram, is not the Abraham that you are accustomed to hearing about. He is out of Mesopotamia. He is a Chaldean. He is carnal. He is an idolater. His family is all into idolatry because Abram is just a few generations from the sons of Noah who had lived both in the antediluvian age, the time period before the flood, and gone through the flood. If I had time, I would really dig into this. They were a transitional group of people who had lived before and after the flood. There's a big difference between before and after. I would really like to dig down into how we are a transitional generation. And in a lot of ways, we are transitioning both before and after. Before and after social media. Before and after AI. Before and after you could bank on your phone before and after you could give through your tongue, before and after you could take a picture with the phone, before and after. They were both before the flood and the diluvian and after the flood because God had saved them through the flood. <laughs> I don't know if you heard it. God had saved them through the flood. The tsunami that was sent to destroy others carried them <laughs> carried them through and they were saved. Eight, just eight, just eight, just eight, just eight people saved, eight souls saved through the water which is used metaphorically for baptism. Wherefore, does not now baptism even save us, even the putting away of the filth of the flesh, even as it saved the eight souls, they were saved through the water. I'm quoting scripture, not opinion. But what I want you to realize is that sometimes God can save you and you can be traumatized by the way in which he saved you. We are learning that the survivors of the Holocaust not only were traumatized those who went through it, but even their children and their children's children's children were so traumatized that their DNA, that's not mental, that's biological, their DNA has been reconstructed as a result of their great-great-grandparents' trauma. More recently, books have been written about the descendants of slaves, yes. how your whole DNA has been rearranged as a result of going through. You, 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 you got saved, you, you got delivered from it, it's over, but inside, Hey, let, let me break it down. Have you ever gone through anything and God brought you out? But you were left with triggers and trauma and, and mood swings and uncertainty. Are, are there any survivors here in the building? You, you survived it and, and you, you, you know you ought to be happy 
but surviving it costs you so much. that instead of dancing when you get out the ark, you're crying. You ought to be shouting that you made it out, but you can't shout because sometimes deliverance itself creates its own trauma. When a baby is born, it is so traumatic that the baby is exhausted, though it came through it, from this to that, the baby is exhausted and the mama is asleep because they've been through trauma. So it's okay to say I made it, but I'm hurting. I, 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 God delivered, but it costs me something. I, I'm grateful that he delivered me, but, but don't expect me to respond in the way you predicted because... It was so amazing. Abraham, Noah lived a long time, died at 350 years after the flood at the age of 950. And his father died at 128. Are you following me? And he is a descendant of the sons of Noah. You have characters in the Old Testament. Can I take my time with you? You have characters in the Old Testament like Nimrod, who built the tower toward heaven. Some scholars say that it wasn't that he was trying to reach heaven, he was trying to escape the possibility of another flood. that he thought if he built it high enough, should God ever decide to flood again, he would have a place of safety to get to. See, sometimes when you've been through something, even after it's over, you're building things you don't need in case it ever happens again. So the second husband gets penalized for what the first husband did because you're Nimrod, you're, you made it through it, but you're building a tower in case, in case if you, if you think for one moment, you're going to come and you get that. We are always building things based on past experiences. So God moves on Nimrod and shuts it down and scatters people all over the world. Scatters them by changing their language at what we call the Tower of Babel. Can I take my time with this? <clears throat> Now, if you look at a contemporary map, you won't understand the scatter. You have to look at an, an ancient map. Put my ancient map up. You have to look at an ancient map to see the, the landmass. That's the traditional one. Put the ancient one up. The ancient one will show you that all of the continents had not been divided yet. That, 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 that we were at one time one land mass that through earthquakes and changes and God knows what, the continents separated. So we are one people. Let me bring us home. There's only one race. No matter how we argue and try to divide by black, white, brown, blue, yellow, Ukrainian, uh, German, or whatever you want to call yourself, millennials, uh, Gen X, Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen Q, Gen O, whatever you decide to put yourself in, there's only one human race. Our distinctives of characteristics are based on the divisions of where we scattered. If the people scattered, into desert places, they develop more melanin in their skin 
and thicker lips and wider noses to breathe in in spite of sand dunes. To survive. If they moved into cooler climates where there was less melanin needed, they came out lighter and brighter. Thinner lips. If they moved into places that were scorching with sun, they squinted their eyes until their features changed and adapted to their environment. Where are you going with this? I'm glad you asked. <clears throat> I'm trying to explain to you how they became idolaters because having had this experience with God, no matter where they were flung to all over the world, they started worshiping other gods. They started worshiping other gods because even though God had delivered the original family, the way in which he delivered them made them be drawn to other gods. When the Bible says that God appeared unto Abram, we have not seen God appear since Noah. This is a big historical moment. God shows up to Abram and says, for what I'm going to do in your life, you're going to have to leave your kinfolks alone. You're going to have to move out of your father's house. You're going to have to go to a place I will show you. I'm going to set you apart and I'm going to start a whole new nation in you that understands blessings. Because the enemy will send idolatry to block up your ability to build in the conduits to receive what God has for you. Hate, envy, jealousy, strife, confusion, turmoil, bitterness, all comes in and clogs up your duck work. It clogs your duck work up so that you can't receive what is available to you because of how much it costs you to get where you are. And I'm not just talking about people who are burning sage in their house. I'm talking about you too, but I'm, I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about all of these strange little things we have going, quarters in our cabbage and all that kind of stuff that we do are descendants of ideologies that suggests that we need a little something extra other than word for our year to be blessed, throwing salt over our shoulder. And, come on, stay with me, stay with me. Stay with me. Not walking in between posts and all of this unbiblical stuff we do, praying to the universe, all this stuff that, that, that we do this idolatrous stuff that we create because we think God needs some help. But if you can ever get your duck work clear, <clears throat> so, so, so the duck work travels through your mind as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So the enemy can't stop the chiller from being cold, but if he can jam up your mind with all kinds of foolishness so that you're not getting a good flow in your life, you'll say, well, I'm going to church, but it's still not working. I'm hearing the word and it's still not working. I go to the potter's house and I'm still not getting what I need, but it's because your duck work is jammed up with guilt and pain and envy and anger and confusion and strife. And you need to take a minute and get by yourself somewhere and do a good cleanse and cleanse out your duck work so that the power of God can flow through you without the obstruction of unbelief and malice and pride and anger because it's stopping you from getting the best of what God 
wants to flow into your life. There's a flow that God wants to release. There's a flow that God wants to deliver. There's a flow that God has promised you. There's a flow, and in order to get the flow, you got to leave some folks alone. You got to move out some places. You got to change some friends. You, you're, you're related to them, but you're not connected to them, and you got to pack your bags and go. Somebody holler, go! You got to go so you can flow. You got to go so you can grow. You got to go so you can move into the next dimension. And if you notice, anytime you leave them, they hate you. You were all right till you left, but the moment you leave, they hate you because they were on assignment from hell to block your flow. But the devil is a liar. The devil is already defeated. You're about to come into a supernatural flow. Who am I preaching to in this place? Holler at your boy if I'm preaching at you. Abraham's father, Terah, dies in Haran. And we criticize Abraham a lot for bringing Lot, but Lot was fatherless. And it isn't so much that he brought him, it says Lot went with him. What I have learned in 66 years of living, you have to be careful who you let go with you. People out of their own brokenness and need will attach themselves to you just because you're going somewhere. And, and you, gotta, you gotta keep your, not just your vision, but your peripheral vision so you can see who went with you. Lot went with him. Whenever God appears to you, other people want to go. <laughs> Some of y'all in trouble right now, not because of you, but who went with you. Yeah, and you felt sorry for them and you had empathy for them and, 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 and Lot's father was Abram's brother and he felt an obligation. And I am learning that sometimes feeling an obligation is the arrogance of empathy to think that you can be something that you were not designed to be to somebody else. What, let me break this down. Some folks you can't fix because you didn't break. Let me say it to the people over here. Some folks you can't fix because you didn't break, but your heart is so big. And, and you want to make a difference in their life and you ignore the instruction of the Lord when he said leave them, you try to take them with you. And some of them when you try to take them, they die because they weren't designed to go to the next level. So Terah died in Haran and Lot hung on and still went with him. Now somebody say, I got to do this by myself. I love you, but I got to do this by myself. Peter, James, and John, you've gone as far as you can go, but I'm going a little further than what you're able to go. I got to do this by myself. I got to go by myself. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. I got to do this by myself. I took you on the mount. I showed you Moses. I showed you Elijah, but I can't show you this in order to get into the flow that prepares me for my destiny. I got to do this by myself. I I gotta let you go, I gotta let you go. But your heart is your strength and your weakness. The same thing that makes you strong and drew God's attention to you is the same thing that makes you vulnerable, that causes people to become ticks attached to you, sucking the blood out of you.
I got a word for you. You have to understand that you have been blessed. Abram, Abram, Abram receives this blessing. Some people can call it fivefold. I counted about seven or eight blessings. He receives them from God. The blessing is not based on the circumstances. Because right after the blessing, the Bible says, a famine broke out in the land. But the famine could not destroy the blessing. Stop defining your blessings by your conditions. You're blessed. Somebody holler, I'm blessed. blessed. Somebody who said I'm blessed has got a million dollars and somebody who said I'm blessed has got a hundred dollars and somebody who said I'm blessed don't have no dollars, but it can still be true in all three cases because the thousand doesn't make me blessed, the million doesn't make me blessed, the dollar doesn't make me blessed, the appearance of God is what makes me blessed. Somebody holler, I'm blessed. You got to understand what a blessing is because we have commercialized the blessing of the Lord and turned it into vain, corruptible things that don't make any difference. If blessings is money, then pimps are blessed and drug dealers are blessed and child traffickers are blessed. You got to stop being a carnal Christian and understand that your blessing has nothing to do with the season you're in and the conditions around you. You're blessed. That's why hell can't curse you. You're blessed. That's why you keep getting up again. You're blessed. That's why you can make it through the desert. Somebody holler, I'm blessed. My God, my God, my God. See, you're, you're a little afraid. You're a little intimidated. You said it, but you didn't say it with the conviction of somebody who has the real duck work all cleared out. But we're going to say it till your duck work clears out. I want you to shake hands with seven people and say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Type it on the line, I'm blessed. Shout it in your house, I'm blessed. Speak to the cancer and say, I'm blessed. Speak to the diabetes and say, I'm blessed. Speak to your kidney failure and say, I'm blessed. Break every generational curse over your family and say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. If the word of God don't make you happy, you're not blessed. But if the word of God makes something leap up in your belly, you're blessed. I want every blessed person in this room to make a noise before God. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. I came out of the hospital blessed. I was blessed in the ambulance. I was blessed when I was bleeding. I was blessed when I was lonely. I was blessed when I was turmoil. Because through it all, I kept getting up again. Because I'm blessed, God is with me. In the valley, he's with me. In the mountain, he's with me. With friends, he's with me. In isolation, he's with me. I don't care where I move, I'm still blessed. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. I'm blessed in my uprising. I'm blessed in my down setting. My body is blessed. My children are blessed. My mind is blessed. My heart is blessed. I don't blame you for hating on me. I would be hateful too. I'm blessed. I don't deserve it, but I'm blessed. He chose me. He picked me up. He turned me around. I'm blessed. I need about 50 blessed people to go into a blessed praise so that somebody can see what it means to be blessed. Ah, ah, I'm blessed. The more you say 
it, your body feels better. The more you say it, energy starts running through you. The more you say it, your blood begins to rush through your body. Shout it again, I'm blessed. We gonna clean this duck work out this morning. We gonna clean it out of all the sediments and all the dust and all the idolatry. Shout it again, I'm blessed. Blessed till you feel the cool breeze coming from the chiller of God's grace. Somebody shout, I'm blessed. Hell can't stop it. Molestation can't stop it. Abuse can't stop it. Liars can't stop it. Backbiters can't stop it. Somebody shout, I'm blessed. Witches are running. Demons are trembling. Satan is nervous because you profess it, because you possess it. I decree and declare I'm blessed with you or without you. I'm blessed when you come and I'm blessed when you go. I'm blessed if you don't call. I'm blessed if you don't text. I'm blessed if you don't write. I'm blessed if I get fired. I'm blessed if I start a business. I'm blessed. I need 30 seconds of crazy, ridiculous. three people and say I've been blessed by the best you can't get it off me you can't take it away from me you can't kill it off of me I've been blessed by the best if God blesses me you can't curse me you can lie on me but you can't curse me you can scandalize me but you can't curse me you can fire me but you can't curse me you cannot curse what God has blessed let the blessed people take over this building. I've been blessed by the best. Come on, come on, come on. Clean that duck work. Clean that duck work so you can receive everything that God has for you. When you got heart blockage, it's not that the heart isn't pumping blood. Huh? It's that the veins and arteries cannot release what the heart is pumping. I'm telling you, God is sending you more than you're receiving. Because huh? the enemy is trying to tell you that you're cursed. But the devil is a lie. Screaming at the top of your lungs, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, I'm blessed till my liver hears it. I'm blessed till my kidneys hear it. I'm blessed till my lungs hear it. I'm blessed till my legs hear it. I'm blessed till my pocketbook hears it. I'm blessed till my business hears it. I'm blessed till the university hears it. I'm blessed till my neighbors hear it. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. I'm feeling anointing in this place. Somebody help me shout. I need somebody that can help me shout. I counted eight words, and this is just for people that's starting to get a flow. Let me see who's got a flow. Who's getting a flow? Who's getting a flow? Who's getting a flow? Who's getting a flow? Who's cleaning out the duck work? They're getting a flow in the balcony. I see people waving all the way up in the balcony. I, I, I see people waving all the way in the back and on the left and on the right. I see them blessed. If you're online, wave at me. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm getting a flow. I'm giving you a flow. These eight promises belong to you. Blessed people, hear ye the word of the Lord. I will take you to a land I will show you. I got a place for you. 
Stop crying about the doors that shut. The doors that shut were for a reason because I have a place prepared for you. I'm gonna give you houses that you didn't even build. Whoever built your house never understood they were building it for you. And all you had to do was walk into the house and you said it looked like I built it. But God said, I'm gonna take you to a place that I will show you. Somebody scream, I'm blessed. Number two, God said, I will make of thee a great nation. You're thinking too small. What I'm going to do in you is a big thing. Tell your neighbor on the left and right, give me some room. I'm not just a man. I'm not just a woman. I'm a nation. I have heard from the king. I'm a nation. God's going to make of thee a great nation. Number three, God said, I will bless thee. Another place he said, I swear I'm going to bless you. I swear I'm going to bless you. I swear I'm going to bless you. Look at somebody and tell them he promised to bless me. He made a contract to bless me. He made a covenant to bless me. God said, I swear, I swear you might be sick right now, but I swear I'm going to bless you. You might be lonely right now, but I swear I'm going to bless you. You might be crying right now, but God said, I swear I'm going to bless you. Open your mouth and receive the blessing. Number four, God said, I will make thy name great. You don't have to bust in doors. You don't have to self-promote. You don't have to try to get noticed. God said, I will make thy name great. You can sit in a corner. You can stay quiet. I'll make thy name great. I'll give you favor. I'll cause people's attention to be drawn to you. But God said, I will make thy name great. Slap your neighbor and say, get ready. I'm going to make you great. You're going to be a target, but you're going to be great. And the only reason they're shooting at you is because you're great. Nobody robs a bag lady. Nobody robs somebody that don't have anything. If they're talking about you, it's because you're great. I want everybody that's been talked about, everybody that's been lied on, to praise God because God has made your name great. If your name wasn't great, they wouldn't be talking about you. Make a noise in here. I wish I had an old sanctified church. I wish I had some old church mothers that knew how to go into a war dance and give God a praise for greatness in your house. said not only will I bless you not only will I make your name great I will make you a blessing that means anything you walk into is gonna be blessed because you came into it everything you touch is gonna be blessed because you came into it when you walk into it God said I will make you a blessing you won't have to try to bless them. You won't have to bend over backwards to bless them. Whenever you stand up, I will make you a blessing. Slap three people and say, I am a blessing. I'm a blessing. If you sit beside me, you're going to get blessed. If you sit in front of me, you're going to get blessed. If you sit behind me, you're going to be blessed. I don't have to try to do it. I am a blessing. Shout yes. 
God said, I will bless them that bless you. Look at somebody and say, if you bless me, you're going to get blessed. Now praise him for the blessing that's about to fall on them. And then God said, I will curse them that curse you. You don't have to worry about who's trying to curse you. God said, the more they try to curse you, the more I'm going to curse them. I'm going to curse their cattle. I'm going to curse their land. I'm going to curse their offspring. I will curse them that curse you. If they fight you, they'll fight me. And the Bible said, God fought the Philistines with hemorrhoids. That means God will fight them in secret places. Your enemies are suffering right now in secret places. Because God said, I will curse them that curse you. You just keep on dancing. I'll do the cursing. You do the dancing. Somebody ought to praise him until witches collapse. You ought to praise him until cancer shrinks. You ought to praise him. Y'all ain't ready for this because you're standing here looking at me. You don't understand that praise is warfare. Praise is warfare. The more you praise God, the more God will curse him that curse you. The more you praise him, they'll be defeated. Their walls will crumble. Their cities will come down. Their bodies will break out in disease. They'll be afraid and frightened. They can't sleep at night because they're cursed. I'm going to give you one more chance to stop being cute and praise God while he fights your battle for you. Praise him while he fights your praise him. The Bible said rejoice when you're falsely accused. The great is your reward in heaven. I command you to rejoice. In the balcony, rejoice. In your living room, rejoice. In your prayer closet, rejoice. I give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If you can't dance, leap. If you can't leap, run. If you can't run, holler. If you can't holler, take a walk. But find a way to praise God. I feel an anointing coming in this place. The power of God destroys every yoke, every condition.
tell you, there was no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. Now praise him again. Again, I say rejoice. Oh, my. In your living room, in your car, stand in your father's house. Give God a praise. check your chimney I'm gonna check your duct work I'm gonna see how clear it is oh! Oh! Abram is Abram is 75 years old His body is dead. Sarah has gone through the change. And before the change, she was barren. So there's one, two, three strikes against him. And still, God says, through thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And I know Abram must have thought, what seed? I'm 75 years old. What seed? My wife is barren even when she was young and cute. What seed? She ceased to have cycles. What seed? God said, I am prophesying to things in you that haven't even been seen yet. Through thy seed. This is, this is an eighth blessing. 
eight is the number of new beginnings. God said, God said, I'm going to do a new thing in you. I'm going to do a new thing in you. It's not even going to make any sense through thy seed. A seed could be an idea. It could be a thought. It could be a dream. It could be something that you can't pay for. It could be something that don't make no sense. A seed stands in the face of all the evidence that's stacked up against it. It's a seed. And God said, through thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. 